Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Forest Ecology Lecture. So, uh, what is a forest? A forest is the trees and everything below them. When we're talking about the trees and everything below them, shrubs, wildflower, grasses, wildlife, soil, water, insects, fungi, bacteria, microorganisms, and then even non-living things, rocks, uh, climate, um, any sort of um, other factors you want to throw in there. All the living and non-living components within the, that canopy of trees. Well, that really seems very similar to the definition of an ecosystem, which is a specific area of the earth that includes all the living organisms and non-living components of the environment. Well, then a forest is an ecosystem by the way that we define it. And it really, um, it becomes really important to look at it that way because you have to really understand that everything that happens in the forest is all interconnected and it all ties together and it's all um, one big beautiful thing that needs all these different necessary components to function correctly. So here's just a little graphic trying to paint that picture. In the bottom left we've got our stream with with fish and some aquatic um, plant life. We've got large mammals, we've got small mammals, we've got birds, we've got insects, we've got um, fungi, we've got uh, soil, and we've got our trees of course, we've got grass, we've got all of these different things that are interconnected and working together. They all will be uh, filling some sort of a niche that um, gives them purpose within this ecosystem and they're all working together because they're all, they all have a, a function to play, a role to play within this ecosystem. Why do we need to learn about forest ecology? And the simple uh, idea is that ecology leads to proper management. And so if we can understand these basic ecological concepts, we can better manage uh, these forested areas. Because, you know, ultimately we have decided to um, inject ourselves into these ecosystems. We are a part of these ecosystems. And in order to do proper ecosystem management, we have to think about all pieces of the ecosystem and how it all works together and how it all comes together and all um, all plays out. Because without having that understanding of ecology, without having that understanding of how all these different uh, all these different organisms and non-living components all merge together and interact. If you don't understand how that works, you can't properly manage that area. You can't properly um, fit into the ecosystem without causing problems. And the big thing that we're trying to get to now with uh, our understanding of the environment is that we want to be in the environment, but we don't want to be a detriment to the environment. And ecology gives us that basic understanding of how this ecosystem works and how it functions properly and how it functions at a at a wonderful level whereas if we're going to insert ourselves in there we don't want that level to drop off we want to have that level be just as successful and so in order to be able to uh, manage it so that we feel comfortable getting what we can from the environment, but also making sure that we are not a detriment to the environment. We really need to have a good understanding of these ecological concepts. So how do we then define forest ecology? Well, I think we just kind of merge, merge it together. The study of forest ecosystems focusing on the interactions among living organisms and non-living factors. So we're just going to put the idea the ideas of an ecosystem and the idea of a forest together and really it is it the idea of the trees and everything below them and everything below them being all the living uh, organisms and non-living components absolutely and then when we're talking about the ecology of it just studying the interactions how do all those things come together and work and form this one um, working ecosystem so Let's figure it out. So let's start with uh, the physical factors that can influence the forest. So we're talking about topography, climate, 
um, physiochemical nature of the soil and water, the geological material, and then of course the anthropogenic influence. So the human caused influences um, that'll influence your forest. I'm going to kind of focus on um, certain ones of these because I think that they're um, a little more important for the um, ecology side of things that we're talking about. So let's kind of look at some of these ones in particular. So the first one that I want to focus on is forest soils because I think when you're talking about the trees and everything below them, well, everything comes from the soil. So we want to basically start at the bottom and work our way up and really kind of um, really understand what's going on in the forest. So in terms of soil, um, soil is the substrate upon which plants grow and where they get their nutrients and water. That's, that's our basic definition of soils, the substrate upon which plants grow and where they get their nutrients and water. Um, what type of soil you have will determine what plants can and cannot grow there, how fast they can grow, and how much biomass those plants can produce. Um, their different soils will have different amounts of organic matter, and that becomes important because organic matter is where, um, every, where um, soil gets its nutrients from. Um, but it depends on the age of the soil and the location. Um, for this area here, uh, the majority, if you go far enough down, you're going to get to uh, granite. And basically, in, in all these areas around the Sierra Nevada mountains, it's granite. And if you don't know what granite looks like, if you've ever been to Yosemite National Park or seen pictures of it, and you've seen El Capitan and Half Dome, and you see these big, huge rocks sticking out of the ground, those are just big, huge slabs of granite. And that's what is underneath us if you go uh, down far enough. Now um, what's interesting to understand about soil is to really understand this idea of weathered parent rock. So through millions of years and through uh, wind and water erosion all, all that soil is is just rocks broken down and broken down and broken down and broken down and broken down. It's you start with you start with bedrock and then with wind and water you start getting cracks here and there and those you get pe big pieces of rock that become smaller pieces of rock and then those pieces of rock just eventually ground up into particles and that's how we end up with soil. Now you start getting other organic matter in there like um, like plants dying out, leaves fall into the ground, branches fall into the ground, animals pooping, animals dying and decomposing, and all of that combines together to give us soil. It's something that's interesting because I, I don't think people really understand it or really um, think about it in a simplistic way that that's all soil is and that's and that's how it's made up, but that's really all it comes down to when we're talking about soil. Now, with soil, though, there's a lot that goes into it. So we're, we're going to talk about these um, different chemical and physical properties. So the texture, the structure, the organic matter content, the nutrients, and the acidity. And all those things together, they determine the capacity for the soil to grow plants, the susceptibility of the soil to erosion and water transmission and the suitability for roads and buildings. So it's soil, all these different properties that soil have are extremely important to understand, to be able to understand how, how to use soil, how it can benefit us, but also how we can take care of it. So let's start with texture. So there's three basic textures. Um, for soil. So there's three basic particles, sand, silt, and clay. Sand is the biggest one, clay is the smallest one. Um, sand, just think of the beach or, um, or a playground um, sandbox that we can see those particles, we can feel how rough those are. Silt is much harder for us to see and clay we can't even see. Clay is 
is tiny and they have very different shapes so if we look at these this close-up of them sand are these bigger aggregate particles silt smaller aggregate particles but then clay is actually these flat uh, long um, blocks that are uh, bound together so they end up giving this different texture when you get um, more of one or less of the other and so every soil every soil is just some combination of sand silt and clay and so if we look here on the soil texture triangle on the right hand side can you get a soil that is just all clay yep can you get one that's all sand yes can you get one that's all silt absolutely you can but all soils no matter where you are are going to find themselves to be somewhere on this chart because they are there's some sort of combination of sand silt and clay and when you whoops there we go when you get a um, when you get a a combination where you're kind of in the middle of all of them where you get a good mixture of all of them that's called a loamy soil so that's right here in the middle of our uh, of our textural chart and so a lot of agricultural soils are loam soils because you kind of want a mixture of these three things because clay is really good at holding water um, but not good at transmitting water whereas sand is really good at transmitting water through the particles but it doesn't hold water well in um, so loam when you get a loam soil you get these combinations of these uh, particles and it really makes for a great soil that you can use really well so how do you get texture well texture is the result of weathering so the result of that physical and chemical breakdown of the rocks and the uh, minerals so you get materials weathering at different rates so you end up with these different levels of sand silt and clay in these soils and it kind of depends on where you are and how weathered um, your soils get so for instance if you're in the desert where it's um, you know during the summer there's not a lot of water and it's a hundred degrees every day your soil is going to get a lot more weathered because you don't have as much organic matter because not as many um, plants and animals live there because of the climate and so you're going to end up with a much different um, soil than if you were on the coast of Alaska or you know next to a river or something where there's always water present there's always animals so you're always going to have um, plant life and animal life and so it's these different um, all the different ways that these that these ecosystems work together soil becomes just another one of those things that is both a component of how how that happens but also um, is a result of that interact of those interactions within the ecosystem so our soil structure so um, another way to think about that is our soil profile so we have horizons or layers within the soil so we're going to have a, a or an organic layer or a litter layer at the top we're going to have a topsoil layer we're going to have our um, our subsoil or on this chart here um, it's also called the zone of accumulation but it's a uh, subsoil layer we're gonna have our parent material layer and then we're gonna have a bedrock and so our structure is just the arrangement and binding together of the soil um, particles into large clusters called aggregates or peds and so the idea that that the soil kind of just has these different layers now why is that important because the layers all influence each other and it's really just an understanding of how soil gets built so looking at this graphic here on the right the here is our bedrock and so at one point in time that is what the soil looked like but then eventually that got broken down into these bigger uh, rocks then these smaller rocks then eventually with weathering with wind and with water we uh, and with organic material we then got down to where we started to get um, this much more of what we would think of as soil but then you can see now up here we get this darker color 
to our soil because we've got roots in it, we've got microorganisms, we've got water, we've got all these other things. And on the top layer, we've got this really dark layer of soil, and that's because we've got a lot of organic matter in it. So the darker the soil, the more organic matter that you have in it. The lighter the soil, the less amount of organic matter that you have in it. So soils typically will go from darker to lighter as you go um, farther down into the ground. Now what's also interesting is that um, not every soil is going to have these same layers. This is your typical structure, this O, A, B, C, R. So organic layer, topsoil, subsoil, parent material, bedrock. That is your typical structure for a soil profile. However, sometimes you might not have an O layer. Sometimes you might not have an A layer. Sometimes you might go straight from an A layer to a C layer. It doesn't have to be the same every single time. And that just depends on um, your climate of your area, where you're at, and um, the other um, factors that might be influencing it, like topography. So, for instance, um, in the desert, more than likely uh, no O layer and um, maybe either a small A layer or not even an A layer. And if you think about what you think about um, when you picture the desert in your head, you picture this kind of um, lighter tannish colored, sand colored um, soil, right? Light colored. Doesn't have a lot of organic matter in it. Whereas if you think about... Um, the soil in a forest. So you're thinking about grass growing on top of it and um, trees growing over it, thinking probably that soil is going to look a lot darker than that soil in the desert. And that's, and that's the right way to think about it. And that's because you're going to end up with this O layer and this A layer, the organic layer, and then the topsoil within a forested area. So just kind of give you, trying to give you a look at it. So if you look on the very right of your screen, you'll see what we're actually talking about in terms of these layers, being able to see an O layer and then a topsoil layer. And here, this is actually an E layer in this one. So we've got a light colored um, one that comes in there. So like I said before, there is a typical structure, the OABCR organic layer, topsoil, subsoil, parent material, bedrock. That's our typical profile, but it can change depending on where you are. So here's an E layer, a layer of alluvium uh, that's worked its way in there. Then we've got our B layer and then down to a C layer and below. So we can see that there's these different layers to the soil and they all kind of have their different jobs. They're, we're gonna see a lot more roots up in the, up in the A layer. The O layer is providing a lot of that organic material that we need. And then eventually you're going to get down to um, the C layer, the weathered parent material, where you got uh, more, more rocks than you do soil. And that becomes important because that's actually where we're going to find our groundwater to be held. Um, so that's going to be important when we start talking about watershed management. And so all these different layers all are important, all have a role to play. Uh, when it comes to the forest. So soil is made up of four things. Most people probably don't think about it this way, but soil is a quarter air, a quarter water, 45% uh, minerals, and then 5% organic matter. And within that 5% of organic matter, 80% of it's what we call humus, or um, basically once organic matter is broken down and we can't really identify what it is, that's humus. And then 10% of it is organisms, and 10% of it is roots. So half of, half of all soil, so when you're holding soil in your hand, half of that is just air and water. The other half, most of it is the mineral manners, that make up soil, and then about 5% of that other half is organic matter. But that organic matter is super important because it provides, um, it provides nutrients to the soil. Uh, organic matter is made up mostly of uh, decomposed remains of plants and animals. When we're talking about organic matter, that's what we're talking about. 
it holds soil particles together and, and provides the um, phosphorus, sulfur, and nitrogen essential for plant growth. So those um, uh, two of those are uh, what we'll call macronutrients, so extremely important, nitrogen and phosphorus. And then sulfur is a secondary nutrient that's also um, very important for plant growth. So it's really important uh, to understand organic matter and the role organic matter plays because it's only 5% of soil. Even if I'm holding a um, cup of soil in my hand, only 5% of that is organic matter, but that 5% is holding those soil particles together and providing essential nutrients for plant growth. Um, and darker colored soil means higher organic matter content. So just right away, if you look at soil and you see one soil is lighter colored and one is darker colored, the darker colored one is going to have more organic matter in it. So then how does it work? How, how does... How does having soil or good soil, why is that important? Well, because it's all part of uh, nutrient cycling and providing nutrients to the trees. So soil supplies all the necessary nutrients for plant growth except for carbon. And that is what they pull out of the atmosphere. So we've talked about that before, the idea of trees being able to do gaseous exchange where they take in CO2 and they give off O2. Well, if we look at that simple calculation, CO2 in, O2 out, that means the C stayed. And if the C stayed, that C stands for carbon. So the soil is giving the trees all the nutrients that they need to survive except for carbon. So where are they getting the carbon? Out of the air, out of the atmosphere. And so that's how trees are able to function. And that's why trees are really important to how this planet functions overall because it they feed off the soil and they feed off the atmosphere and they use all these things this none of the things that happen on this planet happen by accident it all comes together in this beautiful um kind of uh in these beautiful interactions uh the three most important macronutrients are nitrogen phosphorus and potassium or NPK. You're going to see that on most fertilizers. So if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's or any of those places and you get a fertilizer mix for your garden or for your plants or any of that, you're going to probably see some sort of combination of NPK or you're going to see it say something on the fertilizer bag like 10, 10, 10. Well, what that 10, 10, 10 means is 10% um, nitrogen, 10% phosphorus, 10% um, potassium. And so um, force, usually your most limiting um, factor in force is nitrogen. So if, um, if your forest is having issues or having trouble, more than likely um, fertilizer becomes an option because you, one of your first thoughts should be that um, forest soils themselves are low in nitrogen. So it's going to be something that they have a hard time providing to the trees. So that might be um, something to think about. So when we're talking about nutrient cycling, we want to kind of paint the picture that it's it's all of these things working together. So the tree gets nutrients from the soil. It grows healthy. The tree is also pulling in that carbon from the atmosphere. Uh, we get water um, precipitation coming in that helps feed the soil and the trees. The trees are doing photosynthesis. So the tr trees are also providing energy. Um, they're providing sugar and energy down to the soil. They're taking water up from the soil. You got dead leaves falling down, animals pooping, animals decomposing. And um, from our um, parent material, uh, we're getting that weathered bedrock and then we're getting um, that to eventually work its way into soil. So all of this all comes together and all works together in this nutrient cycling to make sure that there is, are these constant nutrients available because when the trees grow bigger and the grass grows then the, the wildlife have something to eat therefore the wildlife then can poop and then the other wildlife can then eat that wildlife and then we get our decomposed remains all of it all works together in harmony
we talked about this uh, before, but just to try and emphasize this again, because um, yes, trees pull carbon out of the atmosphere, but there's also a lot of other places where carbon can get stored. And this just kind of paints the picture of um, that idea of carbon. But what I, I also like about this infographic is just really getting people to understand what else is going on in the soil, because it's not just kind of the graphics that I showed before. It's not just that simple. Like you can see all the different uh, insects and uh, fungi and um, uh, animals burrowing and uh, all of the roots and even what's happening with the water going in, all sorts of different things happening within the soil. The soil is extremely important in terms of the um, health of the ecosystem. Acidity. So this is um, usually a pretty complicated uh, idea, but I like to keep it simple. So acidity is measured in pH. And so one of the things to understand uh, at first is that four soils overall usually are in this range for pH. So they're in the three to uh, five range roughly for pH. The idea with pH is that you want to be as close to neutral as possible on the scale. The scale goes from 0 to 14, so 7 is neutral. Water is a 7. And so the closer you are to neutral, the better it's going to be for plant growth. In fact, if you're anywhere between 5.5 and 8, you're going to be really ideal for plant growth. But we know forest soils overall start out more than likely they're going to be somewhere more like three to maybe almost six or really like three to five and a half. So they're already more on this acidic side. So we know there's going to be some nutrient deficiencies, but we really want it to be more at this five and a half to eight. Some of them are going to be just fine. Some of them we know we might have to do a little more work um, to go get them to go from being acidic to more neutral. So all of this, all of these different uh, chemical and physical properties really tie into the soil productivity. And the soil productivity can increase over time as organic matter increases and more walks weather in the soil, which is important to understand. Just the idea that your soil can get better if you get more organic matter into the system or you get more soil into the system. That's, those are the type of things that allow your soil to be more productive. It can also be improved through management. If you're adding organic matter, you know, through fertilization, you can till up the land, kind of open it up. That way you can allow more air and more water to get in and that thus kind of um, kickstarting that weathering process. So there's ways to make your soil more productive. The hard part is if we're managing large forest areas. If I'm managing 2 million acres of a national forest, it's going to be really hard to just say, well, let's go fertilize 2 million acres or let's go till up 2 million acres. It doesn't really work that way. So um, we kind of have to just really think about overall forest health and, and the different things that we can do. So, you know, how can I increase organic matter in, in my, um, over a large forest track? Well, I know that uh, organic matter comes from animals, animals pooping and animals dying, and it also comes from um, from trees decomposing, leaves dropping, branches, those sorts of things. So if I have more trees and more shrubs and more of these things on my uh, land, um, then I know I can get more organic matter that way. If I've got more animals on my land, I can get more organic matter that way. So I start thinking about, all right, well, how do I improve the wildlife habitat and how many trees can this land hold where I'm adding to the uh, ecosystem but not taking away from it? And that's how you start kind of this idea of taking your basic knowledge of ecology and then turning it into how you're going to figure out your management principles.
So what else in terms of ecology uh, plays a role? So let's go away from the soil now and let's start thinking about other things. So one of the things that influences the soil but will also influence the trees is the amount of light coming from the from the sun. And when we're talking about the light, we're, we're talking about the idea of energy. And so with trees, you're going to have shade tolerant trees and you're going to have shade intolerant trees. And so you're going to have trees that are really um, aggressive in terms of wanting to get uh, sunlight and get and outgrow other trees because they can't handle the idea of being in another tree's shade. Whereas there are other trees that know that they cannot grow really fast and they can't handle that. So they're going to focus on the idea of just waiting and biding their time and kind of growing slower. And so let's go over the idea of shade intolerant trees. So these grow best at high light levels. So when we're saying high light levels, full sunlight. They don't like competition. They want to get to the sun first. It's a race to, to the sun. So often these trees are going to be trees that grow tall and straight. So um, a, some, a lot of conifer trees really end up being... Um, these shade intolerant trees and the reason you can tell that is because of their triangular nature to them they're trying to win that race to the sun first so they're not going to spend a lot of time growing out they want to spend their time growing up um, so they want to outgrow and outcompete so ponderosa pine is a good example of a shade intolerant tree Whereas shade tolerant trees, trees that can grow at lower light levels or at high light levels, um, these trees cannot regenerate easily or grow quickly. They usually establish themselves in the shade of the other tree. So as this tree grows up, there's another tree here that's growing much slower. Um, and basically their idea is to outlast. They're going to wait till this tree grows and grows and grows and eventually that tree dries. And then this tree, this big wide tree grows up in its place and is not going to let anything else grow underneath its shade. And so what that means, and we're going to talk about it later once we get to the idea of succession, is that these trees usually end up being the um, climax tree species. Or in our pattern of forest succession, these are going to be the trees that are at the very end of the successional pattern. Because once they get there, they're not going to let any of these other trees these shade intolerant trees grow in their in their area because they want to stay around so and they've spent all this time growing in the shadow of the of the other trees so once they get there they're there to last so what does that look like so um i put this picture on the left to, to get the idea of light and the different amounts of light that you're going to get in the forest and so you can see the taller trees, they're going to, they're up there because they want to get full sunlight, but there's still things growing underneath the taller trees. And because they're growing underneath the taller trees, they're going to have a different strategy. So they're going to grow bigger leaves so that they can have more surface area and they're going to have more branches and they're going to stick out in all these different directions because they want to try and catch as much light as possible. Whereas the, the trees towards the top of the canopy are going to just grow up because they want to get to the sun as quick as possible. And we look when we look on the right here at this graphic, the big thing to understand is if you have this dense stand of trees uh, here on the left, notice there's nothing growing beneath them. Not only is there nothing growing beneath them, but even on them themselves, they start to self-prune. They start to get rid of these lower branches because... They really just want to get to the top and they want to keep growing. They want to get, it's a race to the sun first. And because of that, there's nothing here in terms of, of trees growing underneath it. There's nothing here because these are shade tolerant trees. These trees took their time. Once they got up here, now they're not letting anything grow underneath them. We're out here in the full sunlight. Now all these different trees and things, we got sh little shrubs here. We got little trees, we got bigger trees. All these things can grow out here because there's full sunlight and there's nothing in their way blocking them from coming up. 
slope and aspect also play a part in um, how trees grow and where trees grow. And so it's really important to understand um, the idea of uh, north, south, east, and west. And so when you have, um, when we're talking about aspect, you're talking about the direction the slope is facing. So notice here on the graphic on the right, notice here's our direction. So the north is this way, south is this way, east and west. Okay, so because this is north, the north is going to have a south facing slope over here. So it's the direction the slope is facing. So even though this is north, because the hill faces this way, it's a south facing slope. Whereas this one is going this way, so it's a north facing slope. So that becomes important uh, in the idea of understanding the sun and how and how our light levels change during the day. So in the northern hemisphere, which is where we are here, the sun appears in the east. It moves on a southerly axis to the west. And so what's going to happen is throughout the day, the sun's going to appear in the east. It's going to move on a southerly axis and rotate above us all the way till it gets to the west. And so what happens um, when that when that occurs is that during the beginning of the day, our east facing things are going to get heated up quickly. But not too much because it's not very hot in the mornings for most most days. Then though, what else is getting sun during that time? Anything that is south facing because the the sun is then going to rotate on that southerly axis. Things that face to the north are not going to get all that much sun throughout the day at all. And then um, when it's hottest is um, when the sun is actually over towards the west. And so that becomes extremely important to understand because th that's going to affect how things grow. So you, when you see um, uh, places with topography and um, trees, you're going to see more dense stands of trees on uh, north and eastern slopes and on, um, on um, things that are south facing or west facing, um, you're going to see more grass and more shrubs. And so what does that look like? It looks something like this. So you can see areas like this where you're, if you get much more sun, it's going to look different than if you don't get that sun. And that's the difference between an aspect. And this is can either be a south and a, a south facing aspect and a north facing aspect, or this could be a west facing aspect and an east facing aspect. But I, I know this is either going to be south or west because of the vegetation here versus the vegetation on this side. Same with um, this picture down here. We get our shaded slopes. So this is probably north facing on this side, north or east facing because it's cool and damp, whereas this is going to be south facing and it's going to be hot and dry. So what's um, if you're looking for a good example of this, drive on the grapevine, I-5, either, doesn't matter which way you're coming from, either from L.A. up here or from here down to L.A. And you're, if you just understand your directions, your north, south, east, and west, and you start looking at all the different uh, slopes and the directions they're facing, you'll see that, that the vegetation grows differently depending on which way the slope is facing. And so that, that takes us to the idea of topography because it, it's extremely important because California has some um, crazy differences in topography. So you can get elevation ranging from 282 feet below sea level in Death Valley all the way up to 14,496 feet above sea level in Mount Whitney. And those two places, one that's almost 300 feet below sea level and the other one that's almost 15,000 feet above sea level are only 15 miles apart. 
So less than an hour, you can go from the highest place in the state all the way to the lowest place. And we've got four different um, large mountain ranges. We've got the Coast Range, the Sierra Nevadas, the Klamath, and the Transverse Mountains down here in Southern California. And so just trying to kind of put topography into uh, perspective in terms of California and the differences that it provides, it really can change um, the look and really change the way, the amount of light levels that we get and the different amounts of weathering that the soil is going to get and the different amounts of precipitation um, that an area might get. And just to kind of go back to the soils, so the idea of what does granite look like and what's kind of below, if you go deep enough into the soil, it's going to look a lot like this down here in the bottom right. So another way to look at it um, and really try and paint the picture of how important topography and uh, these different elevations can be is this idea here. It's a, um, it's a drawing of um, what trees are in the Sierra Nevada mountains. But you can see at different elevations, you're going to get different trees. And you're not going to get all the same trees at all these different elevations. So down here, below 2,000 feet, we get a lot of hardwoods. We get our um, oak trees. We have our oak trees growing in the foothills. But as we go up in elevation, we're getting much different. Now we're getting into some pine trees. And we get higher up in elevation. And we get to fir trees and giant sequoias. And then we get way high up and we start getting into hemlocks and and um, specific types of pine and when you get all the way up here at 12,000 feet you're only getting certain types of pine trees that can grow up there so your topography can even influence um, what types of trees grow there and then you start throwing in slope and aspect and soils and the climate and all of a sudden now you start saying well I get cottonwoods over here and I get um, torea over here, and I get dogwood over here, and giant sequoia over here. And it really starts um, to, to really paint this picture that I get these ones on the western slope, I get these ones on the eastern slope, and it depends on what's happening at, at what elevation as to, as to the different community I might have.